ready for this? Ready? A couple have been in town shopping and they get back and they're going out that evening to really posh do from someone they really love. And they look at their watches and they've got an hour to go. And the wife's thinking, oh, I've only got an hour to get ready. And the husband's thinking, great, I've got time to read the newspaper, do the crossword, and then get changed. <laughs> 65 minutes later, he's got his coat on, and he goes up into the bedroom. And he says, are you really going to wear that dress? No, no, don't say that, boys. Are you an angel? Because I've never seen such beauty on earth. He could say that. But what does he say? Are you ready? Are you ready? And this is what the story that Jesus told the parable of the ten young women is about. It's about are we prepared to see the host? Are we ready? There's a couple, they've been betrothed for a while. Uh, the bridegroom has left his house. He's going off to his bride's home. All the family are waiting there. They prepared the wedding bed. So he goes in, he makes love to her, so he consummates makes the marriage. Everyone's waiting outside from the family. They're taking their time as you would. And then, of course, he's got to wait for her and himself to get ready for the party. Are you ready yet? First time he gets to say that. And then they got to go back to the groom's house. They get the family horse or mule and they go round every single side street in the village so the whole village can cheer them on. And of course it's all taking a rather long time. So those that are waiting outside the groom's house have been there a long time. Uh, waiting, they're chatting, they've not met each other for a while, some of them. But amongst them are ten young ladies. And they're outside and they've got their lamps. Not because it's particularly hard to see, but because young ladies weren't allowed outdoors without their lamp. It wasn't the done thing. But it would bring shame on their families if they didn't have their lanterns with them. And they used to carry them up by their face so people could see who they were. But waiting such a long time for the groom to reappear has meant they're really tired. And their arms are aching. A neighbour perhaps takes pity on them and says, look, just go indoors, sit down for a bit and I'll call you when they come. So the young ladies, they go into the house, they put their lanterns down, and one by one, they nod <coughs> off. They're exhausted. But suddenly, they're woken up. The groom is coming! And they jump up. And they go to their lamps, but they've been asleep for quite a while, and their lamps have gone yellow and smoky. So they attend to the lamps and they realise there's only a few minutes left in the lamps before they go out. The wise girls, they've got a, a small jar of, of oil there and they fill the reservoirs and they trim the wick on the lamps so it burns nice and brightly. But the other girls say, oh, I haven't got any oil. And they go to the, the wise girls and say, look, give me some of your oil. And they say, no, I can't do that because I might not have enough for myself. You're going to have to go off and buy some. There's plenty of people around that, that will sell you some, even though it's late at night. Everyone's up. So the girls scurry off to go and get some oil. And then the wise girls, they join the rest of the groom's family and friends. And they go out because they can see the procession down the end of the road. And they go out and join the procession. And the procession winds its way back to the groom's house. Then comes the key moment in the Jewish wedding, which is where the canopy is put up over the doorway and, and the groom takes his bride under the canopy into the groom's house. This is the bit of the wedding you don't miss, all right? It's rude to turn up just for the food. So then everyone goes indoors, the musicians have been waiting, the food's ready, clunk, the door is closed. A bit later, door knocks. Let us in, let us in. I'm sorry. I don't know who you are, says the host, thinking, I wouldn't invite anybody that would turn up this time of night after the main event. And that's the story that Jesus tells. That's interesting at the end because when the host says no to the Jews of that time, a no wasn't a definitive no. It was, there's a problem here. You know, you don't deserve to come in and you've got to have a really strong argument if I'm going to let you in. So there's this question mark, and Jesus often has this at the end of the parable, which draws you in to it, you know, what's going to happen? Are they really out for good? And it's interesting where this parable is. It's in Matthew 25, and there are two chapters in Matthew 24 and 25, which are all about what's going to happen in the future, about the end times. He's actually finished his ministry to the public here, and he's just talking to his disciples. So it's right late on. He talks about the destruction of the temple, it's an, the unthinkable thing, which has actually happened 40 years later, but also of a later date when he will come again, when the earth is in a really bad way. And he says you won't know the day or the hour when that's going to happen. 
I said it's right near the end because the next chapter, we've got the betrayal of Jesus, his last supper, he goes to Gethsemane to pray, he's arrested, Peter denies him and he's got put on trial all in the next chapter. And of course after that he's quickly crucified uh, and died. So we're right at the end of Jesus' teaching. And he's looking forward to a time when he will come again, what we call the second coming. In that context, Jesus puts himself as the groom. So he puts himself in the parable. And he is coming back to his old home, earth, yeah, where he's expecting to see his family and friends waiting for him in the darkness with their lamps shining like lights in the darkness. So no matter when that end time is, no matter how horrible it is on earth, there will be the faithful ones stood in the dark with their lanterns. And the picture that he gives us here is not one of a sort of a sad, angry, vengeance Jesus, but it's someone that's like a groom who's excited and joyful about coming home, about coming back to his friends. And he, he can't wait to see those that have been faithful, who have been shining a light into the darkness and come and hug them and say, come into the party, come and have eternity with me. Yeah, That's the essence of what Jesus is saying by putting himself in that parable. What I want to do is to look at the parable a bit deeper and see what it can tell us for today. We've got these young women and it says there were ten of them. I like this parable because Jesus often puts uh, women in the parables. I think to balance things out, it's a male-dominated world, that Jewish first century. Uh, One 11th century Arab commentator said that to have a formal Jewish wedding, you needed 10 men there, 10 Jewish men. I think this is like Jesus having a bit of a a poke and saying, right, here we are, and there's 10 women here for this wedding. But we've got 10 women, they've got a lot in common, and they have all been invited to the wedding. There's plenty in the village that haven't. They have all read the invite and accepted the invite. You know, some of other parables of Jesus, there are people that make up weak excuses not to come to the party. But they want to be there because they love the groom. Yeah? So on the outside, they all look the same. They're all beautiful young women, all dressed up, ready for a big party, and they're all waiting to go. But, verse 2 says, five of them were foolish and the other five were wise. Now, why were they foolish? Well, as picture the scene, one of them is at home getting ready and her mum says Rachel don't forget to take a spare little jar of oil with you because that lamp might run out because processions often take a really long time oh mum no one does that nowadays anyway there would be a bulge in my dress and make me look silly I'm not doing that Rachel do as you're told yeah okay whatever she takes the jar and leaves it on the side as she goes out yeah her mum's got the experience hasn't she She's probably been on these long processions. I also think she knows best, and her mum doesn't, and she goes out without it. You know, it's foolishness. So it comes to the point in the story where they're woken up, and Rachel's lamp's going down, she's got no spare oil, and she turns to her best friend, Hannah, and she says, Hannah, give me some of your oil. And Hannah's saying, look, I'm always bailing you out, Rachel, but on this occasion I can't do it. This is something you should have prepared for yourself. Some things I can help you for, but I can't help you this time. You're going to have to go and buy your own oil, because I need this oil if I'm going to be at the wedding. You know, and life's like that, isn't it? There's some things where we can help each other, but there's some things where we've got to do the preparation ourselves. So if I'm doing a physics A-level tomorrow, I can't say, yeah, I've got the exam tomorrow, but my brother, he's been revising for me, and he's really hot on physics, and I'm going to nail this tomorrow, because he's done some great revision. Yeah? Or you could be saying, I've got the London Marathon, I'm going to run. My mate Jason, he's been training now for two years and he's getting his times really good. He's doing that for me. I'll just use his preparation and I'll be fine on the day. And it's not going to work, is it? If we're going to do those sorts of things, we've got to prepare for ourselves. And there's things in the Christian life where we need to do our own preparation. We can help each other and we can love each other and we can go through life together, but there are some things that we need to do ourselves. One of them we need to make that personal commitment to Jesus. And another one is we need to do our discipling. We need to grow in faith ourselves. If you walked up and down the big churches around the country, everybody are in in there and they're hearing things from God, aren't they? But not everybody's ready to meet him. Everyone looks the same from the outside like the ten girls did, but some of them are ready and some of them are not. And you can say, well, I've been coming to church all this time and I've got Christian friends. But the thing is, you can't go to a wedding party, say straight from a mud run, if you're, if you're covered in mud, you've done a big mud run, because 
it's just not acceptable, is it? Without making a personal commitment to Jesus and asking him to transform us, then we're all like muddy and we're, we've all got our old sin that. We just can't get into his presence. There has to be a point at which we say, I'm sorry, Jesus, for what I've done. Please forgive me. I want to live my life for you. Come in and transform me. And at that point, it's like he washes you, you know. He makes you acceptable to go into his presence. Amen. So I brought a bulb along. And this daffodil bulb, but it, it, it sort of looks dead, doesn't it? Mm, yeah. you know, and I think it's like when we can sit in church and we can hear things, we can see things, we take in the promises of God, mm. but it, 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 nothing's been activated yet. It's in there, it's not been activated. But when we make that commitment to Jesus, mm. it starts to sprout. And the green roots start to appear and it starts to put roots down. And we've got the start of our faith. Mm. We're cleaned and we've got the start of new life within us. But we can't stop there. That's the minimum, if you like. Because I'm a Christian now. No one's going to argue with that, are they? You've been clean through his spirit. But if we stop there, I think we're in trouble. First of all, there's two things about discipleship. And these are things we've got to do ourselves too. But there's One is that we do more because we love the groom. We love Jesus, don't we? So if I've been invited to a black tie do, say, and I turn up with my black dicky bow tie, but my shirt's dirty, my suit's crumpled, and my shoes are all scuffed, then it's not a really nice way to treat the host, is it? It's disrespectful, isn't it? When my daughter got married recently, I didn't want to just turn up looking scruffy. No. You know, I wanted to look my best, because I love her. I love her. You know, and I wanted to be, I'm proud father, I wanted to be proud of me. You make your best effort. And this is what discipleship is, isn't it? It's saying, right, okay, I'm saved now, but I want to do the best for Jesus, because I love you, because you love me. So I want to learn about you. I want to pray to you. I want to spend time in your presence. Yeah? But there's a second side to this. The reason why our bulb needs to grow and flower and and produce fruit, it mustn't stay small, is because there are trials coming. You know, life is not easy. You know, and I know a lot of us have been through some tough times and are going through some tough times. Okay? And it says in the Bible that these trials will come there's many scriptures 1 Peter, beloved do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you John 16, in the world you will have trials, but take heart I've overcome the world in James 1, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial so things are going to come our way we're not going to be able to avoid that and there's a warning in Jesus' parables for young Christian. I say young Christians in the sense that those that haven't matured their faith. You know, in the parable of the sower, one of the examples is the seeds fall on stony ground and the, and the plant is growing up a little bit, hasn't it? And it's got shallow roots, but it stays there. Now, it might be lucky, but it might not be. And if a scorching sun comes down, then if that plant doesn't grow, it's going to wither away and die, isn't it? Mm. We need, in our Christian lives, to grow our faith. Mm. Because when trials come, it will show us how much faith we've got. Someone said that we've only got as much faith as is seen in a trial. Yeah. So if you facing yourself with a debilitating illness, or you've lost a loved one, or you are financially ruined, or your reputation's in shreds, and you go through a hard time, how much faith have you got in that moment? Because that's how much faith you've built up. It's easy to think you've got faith in an easy time. And I just want to say three things we can build on. There must be lots of ways to build up our faith. But three things I want to say is our heart, our mind, and our soul. Mm. So our hearts, Mm. if we ask God to transform our hearts so that his love, and it is absolutely boundless, Mm. if we ask for that love to come into our hearts so that we can love those in front of us, Mm. as we see what God does through our love, through his love flowing through us, and we see the great things he does, that will increase our faith. Because we step out into outside of our comfort zone and we do things in his love that will increase our faith mm. and our faith will grow. Mm. Second thing is in our mind and in Paul and Romans says don't copy the behaviour and customs of this world mm. don't get sucked into that. Let God transform you into a person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will which is good, pleasing and perfect. Now, this is where we listen to what the Bible says. It's where we study, where we share with each other, where we listen to testimonies. And we try and get into the way God's thinking. What is God's purpose for my life? How do I do that? How do I do that? And then we understand more about how much he loves us. We understand more about how his purpose is for our life. As we understand our own importance, that we're sons and daughters 
of the Most High and get along that sort of thinking, then our faith grows. Yeah? And the third thing is our soul. Soul's a funny thing in some sense to describe, but it's like that deep part of us that can only be fulfilled with God. It's like that, a God-shaped hole, if you like. So famous people who are rich often feel there's something missing still because if they haven't got God. And it's something that yearns out. And we have to look after our soul by spending time with Jesus, by having rest, by letting him charge our batteries, by spending time in worship and in his presence. And as we spend time in worship in his presence, uh, then we see more of his glory, we understand more of him in that way. And and our faith grows more, doesn't it? Faith grows more in in those quiet times as well, in that challenging time. You know, the groom loves us. And this passage takes us on a journey where we've got those choices, haven't we? Am I going to be that wise lass or am I going to be that the foolish lass? Because it's easy to bumble along a little bit through life. And we could be in one of three positions. We could be a person that goes to church regularly, has lots of good Christian friends, but has actually never made that commitment, never made that discipleship claim. Or we could be a person that has done that, realised that we need Jesus in our lives, asked him into our lives, been washed, been acceptable to him, but then left it there, you know? Because the old life's quite good as well, and we're going to keep doing that, and just not try and get yourself ready for the host. Or we could be the person that says, yes, I give myself to you, and I want to spend my life preparing to be ready for you. Because you could come at any time. Those girls are woken up with a shock. And when trials come, they come all of a sudden, like the shout, the groom is coming! <gasps> is he? I better get ready. Oh, I am ready. That's good. Yeah? Horatio Spafford was a great Christian man who lived in America, in Chicago. And all was going well, had a great big business. And in 1870, his son died of cholera. A year later was a great Chicago fire, and it destroyed all his property, and he was uninsured. And then he decided he was going to go on a Christian mission to England, sort of to rework things out. So he sent his wife and daughters ahead, make it a holiday for them. And on the ship across the Atlantic, it crashed into another ship, and it sunk, and he lost his remaining children, his four daughters, and his wife got to England safely. He got the next ship, and as he passed that point in the ocean where the ship went down with his girls, he wrote these famous words. When peace like a river attends my way. Amen. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot... That was taught me... It is well, it is well with my soul. You see, Horatio Spafford had built up his faith. He'd been prepared. He wasn't expecting any of that stuff to happen. All was looking good, wasn't it? And it came, all came across him. And he was still able to say, despite all this, my faith is strong enough to say that it is well with my soul. And Jesus deeply loves you, deeply loves me. And he wants us to respond in a way where we're consumed by him. You know, we just want to please him and be ready for him. So, whenever he comes, you know, whether we go tomorrow to be with him or whether he comes next week and comes with us, that we're going to be ready, yeah? We're going to be ready for him. So we commit our lives, whatever the day, whatever the hour, that we be prepared for Jesus. Are you ready? Yes, we are. Amen.